Hi to all our pastors, friends, and leaders in South Africa. Uh, it's an honor, it's a privilege always to bring the Word of God, but even in this challenging year that we've all had, challenging two years we've had, uh, thank you to uh, Byron and the national team who've extended this warm invitation for me to be a part of your Kingdom Come Conference. And uh, it's huge privilege to always speak to pastors especially, because we all have the stewardship uh, entrusted to us in terms of not only leading people, but creating a culture. And, you know, I love the idea of talking about kingdom leadership for a second. And hopefully this will add to what your incredible live speakers have already shared. I want to speak to you really from the context of the what I believe is the greatest responsibility we have as pastors, whether you're an executive pastor, campus pastor, senior pastor, whatever level of leadership you're in. More than building a church or building a team, you're really creating a culture. And when we talk about culture, no doubt you've read books, you've heard sermons on it, but a culture becomes almost the default system, the, 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 the rhythm and the flow of how things operate. So when we talk about kingdom come, imagine a church or a context where as the architect or the leader, you have the ability to create a default system where kingdom come is the norm, where the values of heaven are the norm, where the atmospheres of heaven are the norm, rather than it being completely contrary to the kingdom and kingdom come being this divine miracle where life happens in the presence of death or light happens in the presence of darkness. Really the greatest privilege of leadership is to shape through conversation, through preaching, through confrontation, through demonstration, through all of these means building a culture where it becomes the norm. So let me give you some scripture as an example. Peter comes up to Jesus one day and he says, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? And he thought he was good by saying seven. And Jesus says 70 times seven daily, 490 times. He wasn't uh, suggesting on the 491st time that Peter should hold a grudge. It clearly, hopefully you don't have anybody in your life that's offending you 490 times a day. What Jesus was saying, Peter, don't make forgiveness a decision, make it a culture. Be a forgiving person. Let this be how you operate. You know, our Kingdom City story has taken us pre-COVID uh, to 14 countries around the world now, plus an online campus. And the joys of traveling means you see the diversity of cultures. And the ethnic cultures are something I enjoy. One of the aspects that I have certainly been exposed to the most is the driving culture. So uh, in Malaysia and Australia, completely different driving cultures. But it's not right or wrong. Well, in Malaysia, it is probably right or wrong. But it is genuinely just the flow of how things are done. And in Malaysia, you don't indicate, you just cut people off and it's not rude, it's normal because everybody does it. In Australia, if you did that, there's a whole bunch of consequences attached to that. My point is simply this. Imagine leading in an environment where it's normal for people to speak life. It's normal for pe people to have hope. It's normal for people to bring peace into strife and into storms. It's normal for us to have kingdom come as a part of who we are in our worship services, in our connect groups, in our, in our interactions. So I guess I want to take a step back and I want us to almost look through the lens of leadership and ask ourselves one question. How do we turn a virtue or a value into something that is not just something we do, but it's who we are? For example, Rather than having Thanksgiving Sunday, what if we turn Thanksgiving into the culture and people are, as a default system, always thankful? That is the greatest way as, an, as a leadership architect to create a kingdom come mindset, a kingdom come reality, not just on a conference, not just on a weekend, any virtue in your own life. In, in your own world, that you say, God, I don't want this to be something I do periodically. I want it to become who I am. I want it to be something that is my default system. It's like if everybody speaks German and then someone walks in speaking Mandarin, you just look at them strange because it's foreign to the culture. Let's try and give ourselves the space to maybe dream. Think about the teams you lead or the areas you lead. What are the values that you would love to see that are not just good, but you'd like to see them become a culture. So I want to talk about it for a second. Let's, let's uh, take a bit of a dive. Uh, le there's a few keys here. Oops, that's not going to work. Let me try something else. Let's try this. Here we go. Consistent. One of the keys to actually creating a culture is consistency. Doing the same thing 
repetitively, depending on who you read and who you listen to, some say seven days, some say 40 days, turns it into a habit. You will never create a culture if you do things sporadically. Uh, me going to the gym is a great example of something that's not yet culture because it's sporadic. Anything that lacks consistency, you may have an impact, but you'll never create a culture. Um, I hate gardening, never enjoyed it. Uh, we got fake lawn now and fake grass, fake everything around our house because it's easier for maintenance. But I have a friend, pastor friend who loves gardening. I, when I had to do gardening would do a massive project because we only did it once a year he would do a little bit every day and never seems to do gardening because consistency is the key to creating a culture i could create a clean garden by having a one-day project but i don't have a culture of gardening so here's the thing if you say you know we're gonna have a weekend of faith well the implication is the other 51 weekends we don't have faith it's not that there's anything wrong with projects but let me give you a principle anything that you fix by project that should really be fixed by process isn't culture. I'm not against projects. I love projects. We have conferences. We have high moments. We have things that ignite things. But at the end of the day, it's got to become uh, who we are. And that's only there if there's consistency. So I want to encourage you, look at anything that you're saying. Why isn't, this, why isn't hunger for God a culture in our church? Well, is there consistency with it? Or do you just have it periodically? And there's nothing wrong with our programs. I think we should use our programs strategically and intentionally to ignite things from time to time. But ask yourself the question, if it's ever going to become a culture, if kingdom come is going to become the norm, what aspect of kingdom culture do I need to make a regular part of who we are? You know, years ago, our church, I really believed that we needed to move more into the supernatural. I did a teaching series on becoming a church of power, but we started praying for the sick every week. See, if you only pray for the sick once a year, you may get some miracles, but it'll never be a culture. Consistency is a huge key. Here's another word that I hope will help. Unshakable. Unshakable. If you have a consistency with your practice but you don't have a conviction about why you do it you'll have a habit but you won't have a culture let me carry on with the example about the, the praying for the sick thing that we try we started a while ago so we did consistently pray for the sick but what i realized is there were some people who fundamentally still struggled with the idea that sickness uh maybe wasn't from god and you know maybe god provided it he certainly allowed it and there was always going to be a consistency about praying for the sick but until we started to break that down and teach revelation so that they had a conviction that god is good the devil is bad god wants you healed the devil wants you sick and actually cementing the why behind the the, the consistency uh we never really would have had a culture so i want to encourage you maybe the areas of your life maybe the areas of your leadership you're like we're consistent with it but maybe there are fundamental roadblocks. You know, whenever the enemy comes in and sows division, he sows doubt, he sows confusion, always ensure that the conviction level is there. You want to be consistent, but you want to be unshakable. You want to create a team that understands why this is important, not just what is important. Here's the third thing. If you're going to create a culture, it needs to be lived. It needs to be lived. There's nothing more daunting than trying to create a culture that you personally yourself don't carry. It's confronting, but it's a reality check. And whenever there's a failure in culture in a team, uh, certainly in our world, the first place I look is the mirror because as much as leadership can fail and others may not carry responsibility, on the whole, if you don't model the culture, it will never be the culture. Uh, you can teach on it, you can be consistent, you can have a conviction, but it was not modeled. There's nothing more obvious than even as a parent seeing behaviors in your children that are foreign to your beliefs, but are present in your own life. And that is the, the challenge. I see my six-year-old, well, he's not six anymore, he's eight now, he's nine, and he sort of walks with his shoulder, yelling into a pretend phone, barking at people. And I look at his mother and wonder why she taught him this behavior, only to realize that it wasn't her, it was, he's just seen what I've done. See, children don't do what they hear, they do what they see. And people are the same. 
If we're going to create a culture, they need to see it in you. If you want a praying church, you've got to be a praying person. You want a worshiping church, you've got to be a worshiper yourself. You want a generous church, you've got to be generous yourself. There's no way to cheat culture by hoping you can escape the responsibility of having it and yet somehow hoping the rest of the team will catch it. You could lead by instruction, telling people what to do, and create the outcome of whatever you're instructing them. But if you lead by example, you'll create a culture. One gets a result, one gets a way of living. And there's nothing more powerful than it being modeled. Paul said in Philippians, these things which you've heard and received and seen in me, these do. Because he was really compelling them not just to listen to what he said, but to observe how he lived and seeing the authenticity, the authority, the power, the conviction, he, he encouraged them. And so there's something about culture that becomes really tested only in the presence of example. So I want to encourage you, as confronting as that is, that's another reality. Here's another one. Testimony. If you're going to create culture, celebrate what God has done in that area. See, it's all theory until people hear a story of how this has actually worked. So praying for the sick was a wonderful culture. We were consistent. We were unshakable. We taught conviction around it. We modeled it. But then when someone got healed and we talked about it, people were like, wow, this works. You know, if you want thankfulness to be culture, give testimonies of how thankfulness has changed the atmosphere of someone's home. If you want hunger for God to be a culture, show how hunger in a situation changed someone's future. There's got to be stories on the back of it because what we celebrate is what people will aspire to. So if we're trying to build a kingdom come culture the question is what virtue or value are you wanting to see espoused more and then find stories about what god has done and when you're first starting you're like we don't have any fine borrow google talk about what happened in that country or that pastor or that leadership area or that setting and what it'll do start to build faith because what does it do it establishes credibility that what we're saying isn't just uh, about a habit it isn't just about a theory. It isn't just something that one or two does. It actually begins to work. There's nothing more powerful than testimony. In fact, the scripture says in Revelations 19.10 that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Meaning as you declare what the Lord has done, it carries with it the ability of prophetic power, the ability to reproduce. Prophetic is just speaking something that is not yet that will come to pass. And the testimony of Jesus speaking out what the Lord has done in your life, in your world, in your context, to the listener isn't just celebrating a story. It brings almost this pregnant potential of possibility again, because as you declare it, it starts to become uh, in the air, in the realm of possibility. And there's nothing more powerful to actually turn a value or a virtue into a culture than a string of testimonies. Talking about what the Lord has done, because I can promise you that will have a contagious effect. But we shouldn't stop here, because right now, C-U-L-T, we have a cult. And uh, if you turn the video off, it's gonna be bad. So I'm gonna keep going. Uh, I'm gonna run out of room here, but I'm gonna try. The next U stands for unapologetic. In fact, you know what I should do? I'll entertain you by just making this just, you know, stand out more. C-U-L-T-U-R-E is coming up. Unapologetic. What's unapologetic? It does not mean you never say sorry. It does mean that if you're going to turn a virtue or a value into a culture, you're going to be tested. And when you are tested, how you respond in that test will determine whether this thing is real or not, whether this thing is a culture or not. You know, you're like, I'm gonna create a culture in my life, of getting up in the morning and reading the word. Next morning, the alarm doesn't work. Next morning, the, the, you know, the, the kids drive you crazy or the, or the dog stop, you know, he's got, he goes mad. Whatever it is, there's always little things that will test any resolve you have to create a culture in your life, be it a personal habit, be it a team value, whatever it is. So here's what happens. Unapologetic simply means I will have a zero tolerance 
to anything that contravenes the culture. Now, I'd, let me unpack this one. This one may need a bit of unpacking, but I think it's a vital cog in actually turning something from just a good thing that we do as a church to actually creating culture in the setting you're in. <clears throat> Say you want honor as a culture. And in speaking honor, you're consistent, you're unshakable, you, you, you're honoring, you share some stories about honor, honor, but then in other settings you're not honoring. Or someone decides to be dishonoring in a meeting. Then everybody's leaning in and watching what's going on. And if you go, oh, never mind, it's okay. Well, what are you doing? You're diluting the culture you're trying to create because people are watching and saying, if he tolerates that, it's okay if I do it. When people realize you have a zero, zero tolerance for anything that contravenes what you're trying to create, they know you're serious and they know it's about to become culture. It does not mean you become legalistic. I'm not saying you become this tyrannical dictator who never... I don't mean that. I just mean internally there's a drive. For example, um, let's talk about praying for the sick again. I remember the season where, you know, the people we pray for and they don't recover. In fact, they die. And... W- we can allow unbelief to set in and go, oh, you know what, uh, don't, stop praying for the sick. Or we start praying generic prayers like, God, you know, just your will, whatever happens. Because really, we've lost conviction around this. But every time someone throws a seed or they send an email or they're like, you know, this is wrong. I can't believe you do this. People are watching to go, am I going to succumb to this attack or am I going to double down and reinforce because it's only when we're unapologetic this thing starts to carry weight let me give you an example from scripture daniel he had a culture of prayer i think everybody would agree he was consistent three times a day he clearly had conviction about it he lived it he definitely prayed testimony the stories he's written a book about it but it's a wonderful culture and we find ourselves as you all know at the point where there's a scheme against him, prayer gets outlawed, and now, Daniel, we're going to find out whether prayer is just a great habit you've had because that's what you've done, or whether prayer is a fundamental part of who you are. It's culture. Because if anybody prays now to any God apart from crazy man, they're going to get chucked in the lion's den. And what, do, what does Daniel do? We know the story. He goes home, he opens the window, he kneels down, and he prays. And we find that even in the face of opposition, when he's tested, he's unapologetic. There's something about when you get tested that you've got to start to get eyes around that and see it not as the enemy or the devil. Maybe it's a wonderful opportunity to cement what you've always wanted to have as culture. You know, back in the day, uh, riding a bike as a kid in Perth, Western Australia, to school, every now and then you get a puncture in your tire. And we'd go and we'd go along to the shop and I'd just observe as a kid because I had no idea what was going on. But watch this very wise man who knew what he was doing pull the tube out of the tire. And I didn't even realize there were tubes and tires. And you could see where, you know, sometimes you could see where the pierce was. It was tearing. But there were many times you couldn't. It was quite subtle. So if you couldn't tell where the, where the tear in the tire was, in the tube, he would actually get a bucket of water and he would take the tube and he would actually put it under pressure and he'd hold it under the water. And then he'd sort of move the tube under the water and sort of almost like try and get different parts of it underwater. Because what he was doing was he was holding it under pressure underwater because he wanted to find the spot, which was maybe hard to the naked eye to see, where there was a pierce, where there was a breach. And the way it it was revealed was because there was a hole, that's where water would get in, bubbles would come, and he was really holding it under pressure to see where the hole was. And sometimes the pressure you and I go through is God's kindness in showing you where the holes are. You're like, I'm a positive person, and then you run into in-laws or other dramas and you find non-positive stuff coming out of your mouth. It's only in the presence of pressure we find out whether what we think is an ideal is really a culture or not. And it didn't matter what the area is. You might be a strong person of faith, but then when faith gets tested, we find out if faith is stronger enough to be a culture because you're unapologetic about it. And listen, I'm not just talking about someone being dishonoring in a meeting when you're creating an honoring culture. Even internally, yourself, what do you believe when everything gets shaken and tested? And anyway, the pressures of life is God's way sometimes of showing us where the holes in our culture actually are. But then what would happen is he would get out, he found out where the hole is, he'd dry it off, he'd get a patch of 
uh, you know, thing to seal it. He'd put some glue on it and he'd fix it. And I thought, great, we're done. Nope, he would take it back. He would wait for it to dry. And just when I thought it was done, it wasn't done. He would actually put it back in the water. And I'm thinking, why is he doing this? He's just fixed it. But he would do the same process again and he would hold the, the tube very strong and he would put it underwater because now, this time, he's not doing it to find the hole. He's doing it to prove the fact that there is no hole. And sometimes while the pressure on our life reveals the hole in our hearts, there are other times you'll go through pressure and go, wow, that, that didn't kill me. I didn't fall apart when they did that. Wow. And God is sometimes allowing you to go through things so you can see how healed you are. You can see how far you've come. You can see how strong the culture is. And some pressures reveal the holes. Some pressure reveals the healing. And maybe the pressure you're going through right now is revealing a hole. But I want to encourage you. There are some of you who are going through things where if you look back two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, it would be completely different. But being unapologetic is simply saying, God, I want you to seal any hole in my culture so that even in the worst of pressures, this thing continues to rise. It's only culture when it can face opposition, it can face testing, it can face crit criticism, and it still stands the test of time. You know, being thankful or being honoring or being prayerful or being hung hungry for God, any virtues of the kingdom, kingdom come, I want to be a person who believes in the miraculous, whatever it is. When it's tested, allow God to use the pressure to not only heal you and seal you, but whatever it is in the team that you're leading, in the, in the environment you're building, make sure that there's a zero tolerance. You will not, I don't mean legalism, I mean, God, I, I don't want this to go on until you remove this out of my life because God, I want this to become who we are. In the presence of pressure, we find out. So there you go. Consistent, unshakable, live, testimony, unapologetic, and two more. I'll give you them both straight away. Reinforced and E stands for everywhere. And just so some of you, I can hear you, I need red. Here it is. If anything is truly going to become culture, it needs to be reinforced everywhere. Reinforced speaks of depth. You know, when you reinforce a chair or you reinforce a bed, you're strengthening the foundations so it can carry heavier weight. Everywhere speaks of width. If anything is going to become culture, it needs to have both depth and width. For example, one of the cultures I remember we tried to create as a church that we're still obviously always working on is actually a culture of testimony. We want, a, we want a culture where the default system is we celebrate what God has done instead of always you know, whining about what he hasn't done. And so the idea of creating a culture of testimony meant we were consistent, but we, we then we hit a spot where we used to have testimonies everywhere. Staff meetings, let's start with testimonies. Campus meetings, let's start with testimonies. Anyone got a story about what God has done? Testimonies on news, testimonies live, testimonies in connect groups, testimonies when we meet. Why? Because when you give it width, when you give it depth, it's far more likely to become culture. We've got to take any virtue, any kingdom value seriously enough to say it's got to be reinforced over and over again. Don't go, well, we've already done it and stuff. It's reinforced. Do it again and again and give it depth. If you're really going to have a generous spirit, you've got to have depth to your generosity. A one-off generosity is not going to create a reinforced strength. And then you've got to not just be generous to some people. You've got to be generous to everybody because unless that's who you are to everyone, it's not really culture. It's just segregated behavior. And I want to encourage you that really if we're serious about a culture, we're going to have to learn how to Make sure we close the gaps on not just having it in some parts and not in other parts. It's got to be reinforced everywhere. So there you go. A consistent, unshakable, lived testimony that we unapologetically reinforce everywhere. It is not just a sentence. It's actually, for, for certainly for me, I use it as a litmus test as to why things aren't working. So for example, if I go, man, I, I feel like, Prayer is not a culture in this area or this campus or this, or, or in, even in my own life. I go, why? Is it that I've lost consistency? Is it that I've actually lost belief? 
I'm not unshakable about it anymore. I've stopped modeling it. Is that why the team don't have it? Maybe we've stopped celebrating what God has done through it. Maybe when it got tested, we just gave up. Maybe it's not reinforced everywhere. It's only selectively, periodically used. And listen, as architects of culture, as leaders in our field, what we need to do is we're really responsible for creating a flow. It's not a legalistic thing. We're never going to get it right. We have values at Kingdom City. We have atmospheres. We have things that we want to not just be part of what we do. It's who we are. But, but, but with such a diverse church, with so many different age groups, different backgrounds, different settings, everyone coming in with their own personal culture. See, I actually love that. Uh, the cultural side, the dynamic side, the diversity side, I actually embrace that. I personally love that challenge. But it's founded on the fundamental premise that there's a kingdom culture that is higher. So when you say kingdom come is the theme, here's what you're really saying. Whatever Afrikaans culture is or South African culture or whatever culture you bring to the table, there's a higher culture that's greater. And that culture is your prayer. God, let the kingdom come to what I'm dealing with. And if there's a conflict, kingdom wins. See, when Jemima and I got married, we come from different cultures. I'm born in Singapore, grew up in Malaysia, Aussie citizen, Indian ethnicity, and really a bit mixed up like a lot of people are in today's world. But I, that was my setting. And so there was a confluence of styles and thoughts and mindsets that made me who I am. Jemima was born in uh, New Zealand. She grew up in the Philippines, half Aussie, half Kiwi. She sounds like an American. And so she's got a whole dynamic of ministry and how what's f uh, flavored and shaped her life. And so when we decided to get married, it was a whirlwind story It's a, for another day. But essentially, one of the discussions that I, you know, we had was, I said, well, what culture are we going to have? What are our kids going to have? And we all know the theory, kingdom culture, kingdom come. That's what we want. Not Aussie, not Asian, not this, not that. It's got to be kingdom. That's the right answer in theory. The, the challenge, however, proved that when we started to decide, should we do this, should we do that? Well, I don't think that's appropriate. Well, in my culture, that's fine. Well, it, it became this debate of, do we need to find a Bible verse for who's right and wrong? And it really became this clash, which most of us, if we think of our leadership teams, never mind your marriage, if you think of the settings you're in, there's a lot of stuff we end up letting go, fighting over, maybe may not making a big deal because we honestly, are, we haven't crystallized what culture we actually want to have. Once you've done that, once you've said, what does kingdom come? Here's a, here's a thought, not just kingdom come, kingdom stay, kingdom remain, kingdom not just have a moment, let's have a culture. Let's, let this be who we are. Let this be the default setting so that when anything anti-kingdom or fleshly or earthly comes in, it's not that we judge it, it's just it's foreign to our culture. Because if we can create a space where this is the default, think of culture like a current of a river. The stronger the culture, the more naturally you put a piece of paper, you put a little leaf in there, and without pushing it, it's going to head in a direction. Imagine having the kind of church where you put a neutral person in and people just start worshiping. You put a, a neutral person in, people start giving thanks. You put a neutral person in, they start getting on fire for God. The sign of how strong a culture is, is you can put something neutral neutral in it and just because of the weight of what's happened because there's consistency unshakable conviction it's lived it's modeled we celebrate it it's tested it's reinforced everywhere that becomes generally what happens there will always be exceptions there'll always be outliers but the biggest privilege I have in my role is to ensure that whatever I touch starts to look like the kind of culture that God wants for his people. Kingdom come is not only a brilliant concept, it's not only a great theme, but I want to encourage you today to think this through holistically. I'm going to give you one story, then I'm going to close. But I would suggest you use this as a, not only an anagram, but a, a leadership test. Look at whatever hasn't become culture and say, where is the hole? Like the bucket of water, where is it? Is it that it's not reinforced? It's not, it's not, there's no width to it. I haven't celebrated it. But if you take a consistent, unshakable, lived testimony that you unapologetically reinforce everywhere, there's a very good chance you'll turn it into a testimony. Back to where we started. Jesus says to Peter, 70 times 7. Peter, forgive consistently. Understand why I've asked you to forgive. Don't just teach everyone to do it. Do it. Celebrate the freedom you've got from learning how to become a forgiving person. When the opportunity goes now, but that person I'm definitely not forgetting, forgiving. 
be unapologetic, have a zero tolerance for anything that'll violate that and make sure you reinforce that everywhere. Not just Jews, Gentiles, not just male, females, everybody. I want to encourage you. This is something that we've got down perfect to Kingdom City, by far from it. But it's certainly a litmus and reality check as to what we're trying to create. You know, um, growing up with, just like I explained, the context of uh, cultural and even uh, spiritual tensions, I, my life was divided into four. In fact, I don't know if you can see this, but if you think of a Y and an X axis, it was like that. So this is non-Christian, this is Christian, this was Aussie, and this was Asian. Now, if you think of my life, uh, you just do this to your life if you relate. If you don't, that's fine. But I want to show you how powerful a culture is. So what happened was I had a non-Christian world and I had a Christian world. I had an Aussie world and an Asian world. And so I became four things. I had the Aussie Christian quadrant called church. I had the Aussie non-Christian quadrant called school uni, work. I worked as a lawyer. I don't mean like my staff in Kingdom City are not Christian. Uh, we got the Asian Christians, which is sort of ethnic community that we all had to mingle with because, you know, we were migrants and we had to hang out with them. And then we got the Asian non-Christians. Um, sorry, I, that, that was actually community. I beg your pardon, because there were different faiths. This one was some community, but also family all the Asian family that we had that were Christians. So really, I had four different segments of my life and I enjoyed all four, but I, what was my prevailing culture? I don't just mean ethnicity, I mean even conviction on both axes. I didn't know because I was still being, I guess, informed. And so I was really, to be honest, four different people. Four different people. And I was quite comfortable in my segregated, compartmentalized life. And I enjoyed it because never did my worlds collide. However, on the verge of turning 21, my mom said, you're going to have a 21st party and we're going to invite everybody. We're going to invite, we're going to invite all the, your, your mates. We're going to invite the church people. We're going to get invite all the family to come and all the, I'm like, no, that is hell. The last thing I want is everybody to converge because I've just divided my world perfectly. And long story short, she made me have it. In fact, she said, you know, the pastor, I spoke to our pastor at the time, and he said, you can have the party at the church. Who was the 21st party at the church? But I was sort of a little torn, but I was half happy. All the Christian side of me didn't mind it. But how on earth am I going to explain that to these guys? I didn't know, to put it in a nutshell, what to do that night. I didn't know whether to pray that water would become wine or wine should become water. I didn't know what accent to use. I didn't know whether to look spiritual. I didn't know whether Jesus was a praise word or a swear word. It just depended on which quadrant. But I had left, had four separate lives, but on the ones that my worlds collided, I realized I didn't have a culture. I didn't really have conviction. I had four different versions of it, but this is what's gonna happen. In our leadership settings, as we continue to grow, Not you can apply this to your own life, you can apply this to what you're leading. You're going to have to get to the point where in the presence of any kind of clash of culture, you're going to have to realize who you really are, what you're really standing for, what you're really building. Because we will always have people opposing us. It doesn't mean we exclude them. It doesn't mean we're rude. It doesn't mean we avoid them. It does mean, however, we know who we are. Because I can promise you that is going to be the absolute key for Kingdom Come, not just being a conference, but being a culture. I actually want to pray for you. But I guess I should finish that story by saying I've grown since then. I have matured. I now can enjoy the diversity. You hear me talking to Asians, I sound different. I'm talking to South Africans, I sound Aussie. I enjoy the diversity of food. I enjoy the diversity of driving. I love the travel, certainly miss it now in today's world. I'd love to be there with you in person. But I think the diversity is no longer a division within me. It's a celebration of the ability to reach a wider mass. So kingdom come is not meant to become a narrow focus. It means red and yellow, black and white, whoever's a part of your world, pray that God blesses your ministry, God blesses your church, but you'll have a superseding culture. 
culture of the kingdom, the culture of the king that would begin to descend upon everything you do, everything you lead, and it would become the dominant culture. And when that's the case, when that's the case, as a leader, you won't just see periodic moments of God, periodic moments of miracles, periodic moments of grace. It'll become the natural flow. And like forgiveness for Peter, every other kingdom virtue will become who we are. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you that there is right now, under the sound of my voice, pastors, leaders, people who've genuinely explored the possibilities of what could come out of this turbulent season, people considering quitting, people considering whether this is really for them. And yet, God, in the midst of all the opposition, I pray that we would use this moment to refine the culture. We would use this moment to become consistent, to become unshakable, to model, to celebrate, to unapologetically reinforce everywhere the virtues and the values you want for us, to us, and through us. And God, we pray for our teams, our churches, our congregations, our the people under our influence, God, that you would use us to not provide the trauma like I had at my 21st, but God, you would use us to be architects of a value system that would allow kingdom come to truly become kingdom here, kingdom now, kingdom stay. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. Hope that ministers you. Hope it triggers some really good discussion. Look forward to seeing you soon.